this is a more detailed look at the subject of blood thinners based upon a very extensive uh, presentation that I gave on the subject of blood thinners to the Los Angeles Dental Hygiene uh, 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 Society in 2019. Uh, we're going to share the screen here right now. All right, so uh, the subject is uh, uh, blood thinners. And uh, there are three major factors that predispose an individual to blood clot problems. Uh, uh, clinically known as Verkhoff's triad. We're not going to ask you to know Verkhoff's triad, that term, but you should know the three major factors. Factor A, uh, blood hypercoagulability. This is where some people have a, are at increased risk of forming blood clots uh, in the vessels of their body. We'll expand upon that in a moment. Second, vascular wall injury uh, or damage. Uh, whenever there is uh, injury to a vessel or damage, such as caused by atherosclerotic plaque, uh, that increases the risk of blood clot formation. Letter C, the third factor is venous stasis. We'll expand upon this more in a moment, but anytime uh, their person is sedentary uh, and not moving much, uh, the uh, blood in the veins, uh, the rate at which it flows through those veins slows down, and there's an increased risk of blood clot formation. Let's uh, deal with each of these three uh, in a little bit more detail. So the first was hypercoagulability. So some people have genetic disorders where uh, they are at increased risk of forming blood clots in the uh, arteries and or veins of their body. Uh, we're not going to ask you to know the names of these genetic disorders, but uh, just to be aware that there are people who do have this problem. <laughs> and as we'll see, uh, they would be given, quote, blood thinners uh, to reduce that risk of blood clot formation. Uh, what is a little bit more relevant is not those who have inherited a uh, hypercoagulability, hypercoagulable condition, but have an acquired hypercoagulable condition. So we see a list of a number of conditions that uh, increase one's risk of forming blood, uh, uh, blood clots uh, inappropriately. And these include uh, obesity, pregnancy, uh, supplemental use of estrogen, including the estrogen found in birth control pills, uh, increase a woman's risk of uh, blood clots, uh, prolonged arrest or immobility, as we've already mentioned, increase one's risk of uh, blood clotting, uh, a history of a heart attack, congestive heart failure, stroke, <clears throat> uh, again, prolonged sitting, uh, uh, and uh, history of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, inflammatory bowel syndrome, and so on. I'm not asking you, I'm not gonna test you on these specifics, but you should have a sense of us that there are a number of conditions uh, that increase one's risk of forming uh, blood clots. Uh, here on the second page, uh, we know that the entire purpose of the blood clotting mechanism is uh, to protect us against those occasions where we have a cut in the wall of a vessel. So here it shows a blood vessel. There has been a cut uh, or injury. Blood is leaking out. That's called hemorrhaging. And so there's a fascinating process called blood clotting, the blood clotting mechanism, uh, that uh, results initially in the formation of a platelet plug involving blood platelets, and then is culminated by the formation of a fibrin clot. And the fibrin clot is actually made up of a lot of proteins, fibrin protein, uh, that basically seals off that uh, wall, that uh, hole in the wall of the vessel uh, to prevent us from uh, bleeding to death. Now, uh, we're going to see that one of the things, the factors, uh, that increases one's risk of forming an inappropriate blood clot is atherosclerosis. <clears throat> the word athero means fat, and so this is where there's a buildup of fat on the inner walls of the uh, blood vessels, most commonly arteries. So here you can see a fatty deposit uh, forming in the wall of the vessel, and here to the right 
uh, that uh, fatty buildup has gotten thicker and thicker and increased in, uh, uh, in size. And as it does, uh, two things are going to result. Number one, it's reducing the flow of blood through the lumen or passageway of the vessel. So it's reducing blood flow. But secondly, this forming of this atherosclerotic plaque uh, can serve as a, loc a site upon which uh, the blood clotting mechanism uh, is activated. So it can result in a, a fibrin clot that totally stops the flow of blood through this uh, a blood vessel completely, and uh, obviously very serious. Okay, so uh, let's first of all deal with what are the risk factors for developing blood clots in the arteries of our body. So we wrote high blood pressure, a history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, a history of diabetes, smoking, and family history of forming uh, blood clots. So uh, those can increase the risk of blood clots in the arteries. Uh, vascular wall damage, atherosclerotic plaque. So uh, we pointed out that uh, the plaque can accumulate and gradually narrow an artery, narrow uh, the lumen, reducing blood flow. And in addition, a thrombosis or blood clot can form on the plaque, completely blocking the blood flow through the artery. <clears throat> now, when that does happen, when there is a total blockage of blood flow due to this thrombosis, <clears throat> pardon me, this uh, blood clot forming in an artery, <clears throat> if that occurs in a blood vessel in the brain, that leads to what's called a stroke or a CVA, a cerebrovascular accident. <clears throat> it can also result, if it occurs in a coronary artery, and a uh, blood clot in a coronary artery or a coronary thrombosis leading to a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. The symptoms of a stroke, uh, the, sometimes the acronym that's used is FAST. There is drooping of the face, F for face. Uh, there is weakness of the arms, uh, or there could be a difficulty in spe speaking, and that's the time to call 911. So again, uh, the symptoms depend upon exactly which blood vessels uh, in the brain are being blocked, uh, if it, it, and therefore, uh, depending upon which area, whether it's the primary motor area, uh, allowing voluntary movement of our arms, or uh, voluntary movement of our facial muscles, or if it involves what's called Broca's speech center, <clears throat> uh, which is nearby the primary motor area, that can lead to uh, aphasia or a person having difficulty speaking. <clears throat> so call 911 uh, when you see that happening. Uh, if there is a blood clot, a thrombosis in a coronary artery to the heart, so that is manifested by uh, chest pain um, uh, uh, substernally. It can uh, also, the pain can radiate up into uh, the neck and jaw and into the shoulders and arms. Sometimes it manifests itself as indigestion, shortness of breath, sweating, and nausea. So it can be less specific than a pain uh, originating in the uh, chest. <clears throat> now, uh, factors that increase the risk of blood clots forming in the veins include prolonged immobility, such as prolonged sitting in a car, a plane, or being bedridden. Uh, also, uh, individuals taking birth control pills, uh, pregnancy, smoking, atherosclerosis, genetic factors can also increase the risk of blood clots forming in the veins. Now, the symptoms of a blood clot in a vein are usually more obscure, more difficult to uh, assess. Uh, it can be accompanied by pain uh, associated with where the blood clots are occurring in those veins. If it's occurring, for example, in the legs, uh, such as related to a condition called thrombophlebitis, blood clots forming in inflamed veins of the legs. So there may be pain, swelling, warmth, and redness in the legs. Now, the, the next thing listed here is assessment of the risk uh, that a patient has uh, to a blood clot. And the reason why they use the word thromboembolic is the formation of a blood clot is technically called a thrombosis. Uh, if that blood clot uh, becomes dislodged and starts to circulate in the bloodstream, 
and ends up obstructing the flow of blood distant from where that blood clot originated, that's called an embolism. So whether we're talking about an obstruction of blood flow uh, in a vessel due to a, a thrombosis, a blood clot, or an embolism, an obstruction of uh, blood flow uh, due to a blood clot that became dislodged or originated, let's say, in the legs and now is obstructing blood flow in the brain. So that's called an embolism. So in either case, it's called a thromboembolic risk. The, uh, this is a way of scoring uh, the risk to assess uh, how bad uh, the risk factors are. And you can see this includes any history of congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, uh, being older than 75 years of age, a history of diabetes, or a history of a previous stroke, a TIA, a transient is uh, ischemic attack. That's like a precursor to a stroke where a person momentarily may lose consciousness and fall. Uh, or a, a thromboembolism in general. Uh, I am not going to test you on uh, the scoring method, but it's simply showing a way to evaluate uh, one, a patient's risk of having a, thromb, uh, a, a blood clot. <clears throat> this uh, uh, scoring continues on page five, and it considers some additional factors uh, that we're not going to worry about. Now on uh, page uh, uh, six, uh, so I've reviewed uh, the blood clotting mechanism. And uh, so there is what's known as an extrinsic pathway and an intrinsic pathway. And where they join together, it forms what's called the common pathway that culminates in the formation of a fibrin clot. Now in the uh, extrinsic uh, pathway, uh, this is where uh, injured cells in the wall of a blood vessel release a chemical called tissue factor. And uh, a tissue factor is going to uh, activate a, uh, a protein circulating in the blood called prothrombinase or Stuart Prower Factor 10A. Uh, 10A. So uh, obviously this protein, if it's called prothrombinase, it acts as an enzyme in the blood and uh, it's going to catalyze the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Now there is another pathway that also activates that uh, uh, prothrombinase uh, or uh, Stuart Power Factor 10A, <clears throat> and that's known as the intrinsic pathway. This involves the release of platelet factor by blood platelets. Blood platelets are really the first guys on the scene uh, to uh, form a plug in the injured wall of a vessel but uh, uh, they can also play a role in the blood clotting that is initiated by uh, uh, atherosclerotic plaque. So whether it's tissue factor released by the injured cells of the wall of a vessel, or whether it's platelet factor released by blood platelets uh, that have attached or adhered to either the cut wall of a vessel or uh, a, a atherosclerotic plaque, uh, in either case, both tissue factor and platelet factor activate uh, the enzyme prothrombinase or factor 10A. Uh, prothrombinase converts prothrombin into thrombin. The, the prothrombin is another protein circulating in the blood, another blood clotting factor. Uh, thrombin uh, acting with calcium uh, ca uh, catalyzes the conversion of another protein circulating in our blood called fibrinogen and turns it into the actual fibrin clot. Now on uh, page seven, I've summarized exactly what we just said. Uh, so uh, there's the initially the blood platelets form a platelet plug if a vessel has been cut. Uh, there are, we wrote two uh, pathways for forming the fibrin blood clot. The intrinsic pathway involving blood platelets releasing platelet factor, which activates the prothrombinase uh, or steward power factor 10A and the extrinsic pathway where the injured vessel wall releases tissue factor, uh, which also uh, activates prothrombinase. That leads us to the common pathway where uh, prothrombinase acting with calcium converts prothrombin into thrombin and thrombin converts fibrinogen into the fibrin clot. Okay, now there are a number of way, a number of blood tests that are run to evaluate uh, the uh, blood clotting mechanism. 
to see if the blood clotting mechanism is acting normally or whether it's delayed or whether it acts too rapidly uh, where, the, where somebody tends to form uh, too many blood clots. On page eight, uh, we're not going to worry about the specific uh, blood clotting tests, but now let's move on to the more relevant subject of what are, are the drugs used in the management of thromboembolic uh, diseases, uh, the uh, proclivity to form uh, blood clots where it can be uh, detrimental. So uh, first we'll mention the antiplatelet drugs, uh, and uh, then we'll talk about the anticoagulant drugs. Now, both antiplatelet and anticoagulant drugs are prescribed for patients with atherosclerosis, ischemic heart disease, a AFib or atrial fibrillation. Uh, we'll speak more about that in a moment. Uh, artificial heart valves, valvular heart disease, which increase the risk of blood clotting, and uh, uh, or a history of coronary artery disease, angina, or carotid artery disease. Remember, coronary arteries are the arteries that bring blood to or your heart. And carotid arteries are the arteries that carry oxygenated blood to your brain. Also, uh, 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 coronary angioplasty stents that have been in pla uh, placed in the coronary arteries, coronary artery bypasses, a history of myocardial infarction, a history of deep vein thrombosis or embolism, a history of TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, attacks or strokes, uh, and uh, also. Uh, a history of hip uh, replacement surgery, all increase the risk of blood clotting and the patient may be given or prescribed uh, antiplatelet drugs or anticoagulants. Now the antiplatelet drugs interfere with the blood platelets attaching to the blood vessel wall. So if the blood platelets are, uh, do not attach to the uh, 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 wall of the vessel, then they don't uh, initiate uh, the uh, blood clotting mechanism. Uh, the uh, coagulation. <clears throat> so uh, the first drug that's uh, commonly used and the least potent is aspirin. Uh, a little baby aspirin, as they say, is uh, commonly prescribed where a patient takes that once a day uh, to reduce their risk of forming uh, blood clots. Again, this is only given to people, only recommended if somebody is has a history of uh, blood clots uh, leading to uh, increasing the risk of having a stroke or a heart attack. Another drug, a little bit more potent, is called clopidogrel. It goes under the brand name Plavix. These drugs, again, aspirin and Plavix are commonly used. Uh, Plavix is uh, the 34th most prescribed drug in the United States. Now, there are some other drugs that are also prescribed that are antiplatelet drugs. Uh, in addition to Ticlid, uh, there's Pleto and Persantine, there's Agronox, which is a combination of the Persantine with Aspirin and Berlinta. But the only two that I'd like you to know by name are Aspirin and uh, Plavix. Uh, okay, so uh, now those are the drugs uh, that are used, uh, the antiplatelet drugs, uh, if somebody's risk of uh, having a blood clot is they're at greater risk, but it is not a, an extreme risk. But if somebody has actually had a heart attack or a stroke, then they may be given something much more powerful called warfarin, which goes under a number of brand names, including Coumadin. Now, uh, warfarin is not an antiplatelet, it is an anticoagulant, it is anticoagulant. And it is used to prevent uh, the blood clots associated with a history of ischemic heart disease, deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolisms, uh, a heart valve, uh, artificial heart valve, or a history of uh, hypercoagulable diseases, including those that may be uh, genetically inherited or acquired. Uh, warfarin is the number 41, uh, 41st most prescribed drug in the uh, United States. So it's very, again, commonly used. Uh, it, what it does is it actually uh, interferes with vitamin K. Now, vitamin K is a uh, vitamin that is needed as a coenzyme for the, in the liver for the synthesis of a number of blood clotting factors, including factor 10, uh, prothrombinase. And uh, so warfarin interferes. It actually uh, inhibits vitamin K, 
It's called a vitamin K antagonist. It's sometimes abbreviated a VKA, vitamin K antagonist. Uh, and uh, by interfering with uh, vitamin K, it causes a re resulting decrease, decline in the in amount of uh, these blood clotting factors produced by the liver circulating in our bloodstream. Uh, now, uh, when somebody takes warfarin, Coumadin, it actually takes uh, about a, we a week before you start to see the effect. Also, I might add that when somebody stops taking a warfarin, it takes almost a week before the effects of the warfarin terminate. So there is a delay, a lag time in its onset of action and an, uh, a delay in its cessation of action when you stop taking it. That's a problem, uh, it, it usually. It also has a very long half-life. So, uh, uh, and again, that's, that's actually part of why uh, the effect uh, it takes a while to end when you stop taking the uh, drug. Uh, so the duration of action is long. It's about almost a week, five days. It also has a narrow therapeutic index. Uh, that's the margin of safety between the uh, therapeutic dose and the lethal dose. So uh, if somebody takes too much of it, they can uh, bleed profusely, they can uh, hemorrhage, uh, because again, this drug is interfering with the forming of a blood clot. Again, we would never prescribe this drug for a normal person. It's only prescribed to people who are at increased risk of forming a, a blood clot that could cause a heart attack or a stroke or other problems. Um, now, there, there are many other uh, factors that can affect the efficacy of the warfarin. There are drugs that, in, uh, that affect the metabolism of the warfarin that may uh, de uh, slow down the metabolism and therefore enhance the effect of warfarin. Uh, it is affected also by one's diet, what one eats. Are you eating foods containing high amounts of vitamin K or not? Uh, looking, moving on to page 10. So again, there's other drugs that may uh, interfere uh, with the metabolism of the warfarin, enhancing its effect. Uh, the, um, so diet, alcohol, tobacco can also affect the efficacy or effectiveness of the warfarin. Now, there's a very important concept that you should know, uh, known as the INR. The International Normalized Ratio, or INR, is a way of evaluating uh, whether uh, their, the patient's blood clotting uh, is normal or uh, is uh, taking uh, two times or three times longer than normal uh, to clot. Basically what it is, is it's where they carry out a, a prothrombin time blood test, which measures the amount of time it's taking uh, for the uh, blood clot to form, the fibrin clot. They compare that with the normal level in that lab and they get a number. Uh, and you don't have to worry about the details of the INR, uh, the formula, but you should know that an individual whose blood clots normally and is not taking any blood thinner would have an INR equal to one. That just means that their blood clotting is totally normal. If somebody is taking warfarin, uh, it's going to slow down their blood clotting. And so if we have, if the, when we test them, when we give them a, the prothrombin time test, if their INR is two, it means that the blood of a person taking warfarin takes twice as long to blood clot than a normal person. If, uh, if they um, uh, have an INR of say three, it means it takes three times longer for their blood to clot than normal. Now, normally you wanna give enough warfarin if the patient is taking warfarin or Coumadin uh, so that it, their INR is two or three. In other words, we want to slow down uh, the forming of a blood clot to reduce their risk of blood clotting uh, and heart attacks, uh, uh, re resulting heart attacks and strokes. And the therapeutic range is to take the warfarin so that they have an INR of uh, two to three. Uh, and that means it's taking two or three times longer than normal. That's what we want. That's the therapeutic range. We don't want to have it more than three because that means that it's taking now more than three times as long to form a blood clot and that can result in fatal hemorrhaging. You can see there is a little bit of variation in uh, what they want that INR to read 
depending upon exactly what clinical disorder the patient has. You'll notice that for deep vein thrombosis or AFib, they want it in that two to three range. If they've already had a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, an MI, they want it actually a little bit higher in the 2.5 to 3.5 range. And if they have it, let's say, in an inherited uh, genetic uh, uh, hypercoagulable uh, dis disorder, uh, they might want it even uh, almost as high as four. Probably not, but could be. Could be. All that we're going to ask you to know is that the normal range, uh, INR range for warfarin or Coumadin should be two to three. Now there's actually a device that can give you that uh, INR real quickly. Uh, th this is a little portable handheld device. Uh, you prick uh, the finger and draw some blood here at the bottom and it gives you the INR as a digital readout. Uh, and here it shows an INR 2.8, which is in that uh, two to three uh, range that we said is normally the therapeutic range. If you want to buy this device, uh, the price is uh, you can get one for about uh, under $600. Okay, so um, the, uh, we did write here that uh, if somebody has uh, an excessively uh, high INR, if, in other words, if they take in too much warfarin or Coumadin uh, that puts them at risk of uh, hemorrhaging or bleeding, uh, so we can, uh, the antidote is to give them more vitamin K because we said the entire mechanism by which uh, warfarin works is that it interferes with vitamin K. So you can, by taking more vitamin K, uh, uh, phyloquinone uh, that can uh, counteract the effect of the warfarin. Uh, now, there is a third category of drugs used uh, as blood thinners, uh, and uh, this is a new cat class. So, so far we've spoken briefly about antiplatelets that interfere with the uh, attaching of blood platelets to the wall of the uh, blood vessel. We've spoken of warfarin or Coumadin, which uh, interferes with the synthesis of a number of blood clotting factors uh, in the liver by interfering with vitamin K. Uh, that's very powerful. The third new uh, group are they called the direct acting oral anticoagulants or DOACs, direct acting oral anticoagulants. These are especially used uh, to manage uh, people with AFib, a history of atrial fibrillation. Now, uh, in terms of atrial fibrillation, this is where the heart beats abnormally rapidly in the atria. They, they uh, flutter or fibrillate. This is not the ventricles, but the atria, the upper chambers of the heart. And the risk of this developing increases as one grows older. Uh, the average age uh, for men who start to show AFib is 67 years old. Uh, it's a little bit higher in women, 75 years old, before they start uh, to show AFib. Now, this does not mean that most people develop AFib, but those who do usually develops uh, in, their, uh, in, their, in an elderly age. Uh, and it currently affects about 2.7 million Americans. Uh, so when the atria are kind of quivering or fibrillating, uh, that creates turbulent blood flow in the heart that increases the risk of blood clots forming. Now, the very first of these direct acting, uh, uh, direct orally acting uh, anticoagulants uh, was a drug called Pradaxa. It was introduced in 2010, but I'm not going to ask you about that. I'm going to ask you instead about a newer group of these direct acting uh, oral uh, anticoagulants uh, that are called prothrombinase inhibitors. And uh, they specifically inhibit uh, factor 10A, which we've said is also known as prothrombinase. And uh, these include uh, a number of new drugs. And I wanna show you something very cool about their names. When you look at the generic name, such as the first run, uh, Rivaroxaban, uh, which goes under the brand name Zarelto, you'll notice that built into the generic name, it has an XA because it, it is interfering with factor XA, 10A, prothrombinase. And in the case of its brand name, Zarelto, even it has that XA. So it's easy to recognize that it's inhibiting uh, factor 10A, the Stuart Power factor, 
or prothrombinase enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of prothrombin into thrombin. Uh, you'll notice another one is a pixaban, or it goes under brand name Alequis. Uh, while uh, the brand name doesn't have that XA, the generic name does have XA. The same is true with Vitrixaban and Edoxaban. And uh, you'll notice the brand name of uh, Bevixa, uh, Bevixa has that XA as well. So uh, the two that I'm going to focus on, though, are Zarelto and Alequis. Zarelto is ranks number 105 in the, as the most prescribed drug in the United States, and Alequis is number 123. So these are not as commonly used as aspirin or uh, uh, Plavix, Clopidogrel. Uh, they are not as uh, commonly used as Warfarin or Coumadin, uh, but there has been increasing uh, use of these newer drugs. Now, uh, we do not use the INR uh, to assess or evaluate uh, whether we're taking the right dose of these uh, direct acting oral anticoagulants. Uh, they, the, we only use the INR to evaluate uh, warfarin or, uh, or coumadin. Uh, it is uh, only those. Now, uh, the direct acting uh, oral anticoagulants uh, ha have the advantages over warfarin in that they have a rapid onset of action I instead of, unlike a Coumadin, which requires a, a week before you start to see an effect, and a rapid offset of action. So uh, it stops acting pretty much uh, by the next day after when you stop taking it. Uh, instead of uh, having a prolonged uh, delay in the, uh, uh, where the action ends in the case of warfarin. Uh, there is less need for blood testing and monitoring. Uh, the, what you eat, the uh, drugs you're on have less effect uh, in uh, affecting the metabolism of uh, Xarelto and these other direct acting, uh, oral acting uh, anticoagulants. And, uh, but, uh, and in addition, they are less likely to cause intracranial hemorrhaging or bleeding compared to Coumadin. That's a major risk factor in taking Coumadin or Warfarin. Uh, the, uh, these direct uh, acting, uh, orally active uh, anticoagulants, uh, however, do uh, have a more frequent risk of GI bleeding over uh, warfarin and uh, also cannot be given to patients with renal insufficiency. Okay, the last topic I want to address is as a, a clinician, as a dental hygienist, uh, and it's true for uh, all the clin clinical or medical fields, uh, how do you manage your patients who are taking these blood thinners? So if they uh, are taking blood thinners, uh, that can delay, they may tend to bleed a little bit more than other patients because they, uh, when you uh, cut the gums and so on, injure the gums and there's bleeding uh, as you, uh, uh, scaling and so on. Uh, so there is a greater a, a delay in uh, blood clotting uh, because of the patient taking these blood, so-called blood thinners. However, having said that, uh, serious, serious bleeding from most dental procedures, uh, and that includes dentistry as well as dental hygiene, uh, even while taking these blood thinners is very uncommon. Uh, what I've listed next are a number of uh, methods that are used to reduce uh, bleeding in somebody who is bleeding from uh, the gums, and you can uh, take a look at that. Uh, so uh, the one last aspect to this. Uh, is it necessary to check clotting times before an appointment? Now remember, the only drug we checked, uh, check uh, for blood clotting times using that INR is warfarin. Uh, we don't need to uh, check blood clotting times for antiplatelet drugs or the di uh, direct orally active anticoagulants. Uh, is it necessary? Yes, we should if they're on warfarin, which is the most powerful of all the anticoagulants. Now that doesn't mean you have to check for it. But what you, uh, we would recommend is that you consult with the patient's physician. Find out from the uh, 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 physician what the current INR is and simply get an okay that it's all right for you to do uh, to, uh, 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 to basically uh, provide dental hygiene uh, services for your patient. On page 14, so uh, we listed some uh, options here, but again, in general, the general consensus is uh, you do not need to, uh, all, all you need to do if somebody is taking a blood thinner, 
uh, or specifically, I should say, uh, warfarin or Coumadin is uh, simply consult with the uh, doctor and get an approval that it's all right uh, to go ahead. Uh, this is the uh, standard uh, practice uh, by, accepted by everybody today. Uh, here is a statement by the American College of Chest Physicians that recommend continuing anticoagulant therapy for dental extractions, which are certainly uh, more invasive than dental hygiene. The American Academy of Neurology in 2013 recommended that patients taking aspirin or warfarin uh, or any of these anticoagulants for stroke prevention and undergoing dental procedures continue taking their medication. Finally, the American Dental Association states that it's generally agreed that anticoagulant including antiplatelet drug regimen should not be altered prior to dental treatment. If you stop taking or take less of the anticoagulant medication, you increase your risk for blood clot development, which could result in a thromboembolism, a stroke or a heart attack, and the risk of stopping or reducing this medication routine outweigh the consequences of prolonged bleeding, which can be controlled with local measures. So uh, that's the uh, current status. Okay, so uh, what uh, this concludes uh, our brief review of blood thinners, going exploring them in a little bit greater detail. Hope that's been helpful. Thank you.